Good evening, my name is Dane Wormwell. I am the CEO of NIW and the co-creator of the Kaizen Plan. The objective of this webinar is that we have a lot of people talking about Kaizen, why we created it, what its purpose is, and how we believe it will help. So before I start, let me give you a little bit of background on why we're qualified to have this conversation. So we as a firm, NIW, have focused on the financing of life insurance for the last 23 years. We've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, and so we know the pitfalls of what goes wrong when uh, people don't design it correctly, but we also see the advantages of it, predominantly because we were going to be the first clients. So when we created NIW 23 years ago, the plan was to create a company that was transformative to the industry. Uh, so the cause, if you like, is very important to all the founders of the firm. You see, many of you um, have your own companies, run your own businesses. And when you start a business, you have all these great dreams, but quite often it's a lot harder to actually make that materialize. So you go through the period of uh, I've created the company great, I'm really excited. You go through the period of hardship where you have to really dig deep to see the company through to eventual success. And as you go through these various phases, you have different needs, thoughts, and concerns. Now, given what I've said, uh, I plan to look at this uh, from the perspective of a client, because uh, I was one of the first clients in Kaizen, as a CEO who woke up every morning saying, how do I make sure I protect not just our clients, but also the 30 or so employees and their families? And then as a father who uh, has adult children who worries about the world they'll be inheriting and wants to protect them as you always have done if you're a parent. So let's start um, as me, the employee. I mentioned that when you start a business, and initially it's tough, and cash flows tight, you don't make the income you thought you were going to make, etc., etc. We've all heard the sob story. Now, eventually, uh, if you're lucky enough to be uh, successful in the endeavor, you start to make good money. And then when I hit 50, we started to realize uh, that we're no longer immortal, <laughs> that at some point we'd have to start planning for retirement. So even though we were sort of making a reasonable money and a quality of life was good, when you start saving in your mid-50s in a meaningful way, you know, we had some savings but not very much, you start to realize that unless you're incredibly lucky with your investments, there is no flipping way you're going to get to the number that you've set for yourself that ensures your quality of life in your golden years. So you've made all these sacrifices and you've made this promise to yourself, but unless you look at the, the data, statistically, you're not going to get there unless you're very lucky. And luck is really a very poor plan. So imagine, if you would, that we're in this position where you say, wow, I, my business is great, we're, we're doing well, but the maths doesn't look good for me in retirement. That was a bit humbling, to be honest. So if you think it just applies to just me, uh, think again. It turns out that on average, uh, in America, people have only saved about 70 to 80 percent of what they will need, uh, with 52 percent of households in the United States saying they will not be able to pay for essential expenses. You see, about 74 percent of what determines how much actual money you have in retirement is driven by the amount of capital, and only 26 percent is based on investment return. Now, that's kind of interesting, because if you think about all your experience with financial planners, they will be coming up with the best way to invest the money that you can save. Almost none of them have come up with a solution of how to get more money in play. And that is the central goal of Kaizen, to bring more capital to bear. OK, before we go further, let's watch this quick video that explains exactly what Kaizen is. When it comes to retirement, executives often think investing in stocks and other investments will provide enough income to maintain their current lifestyle for the average 22-year retirement. In most cases, this ends up not providing the means to maintain their lifestyle throughout retirement. 
and when they come to this realization, it's too late to do anything about it. Most highly compensated people don't start saving until their 40s, missing out on years of compounding interest. This result is a significant loss in retirement funds, and in their 40s, most are saving about 9% of their income. So how much should you be saving if you want to maintain your current lifestyle in retirement? 33% of your income. There's got to be another way to meet retirement goals without having to use a third of your income during your career. Introducing Kaizen. Kaizen is a proactive strategy that gives you access to extra money upfront, providing you the potential to earn more for your retirement, protecting your future income without putting a drain on your current way of living. This strategy helps you maintain your current lifestyle in the event of chronic illness, premature death, or inability to sufficiently save for retirement. Traditional retirement plans are typically insufficient for high income earners. Kaizen is different because it makes the use of leverage without the need for participant loans, interest payments, or personal guarantees. One of the greatest advantages of leverage is it provides an opportunity to significantly enhance your ability to save for retirement. Experts agree, when used correctly, leverage is a very powerful retirement tool. Even Forbes says you can leverage your way to a richer retirement. Your contributions are matched by the lender for the first five years. Then the lender uses that as a security for the additional funds for the next five years. The contributions are used to fund a cash accumulation life insurance policy. A minimum amount is used to purchase the death benefits and living benefits, while the majority of the cash is used to maximize your potential tax advantage growth. What could be better? Kaizen also has unique cash accumulation features within the policy. When a market index like the S&P has growth, it is calculated and credited to you. Once gains are credited, they cannot decline due to market losses. This helps keep your money safe. Would you rather have this in retirement or the potential for 60 to 100% more retirement income with Kaizen? Secure your lifestyle with Kaizen. More money, more protection, and more confidence. So the point about Kaizen is it's not that the life insurance product we use is designed to be a better investment than, say, a stock portfolio or anything like that. We're not trying to compare it to other investments. What we are trying to do is find something that allows us to attract capital in a very, very attractive way to us personally. And that means de-risking the loan. But borrowing has risk. So the moment I mention leverage or borrowing, everybody goes, ooh, risk. What happens if interest rates go up? What happens if um, something goes wrong and it makes me bankrupt? Um, what it will do to my credit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The key central theme of Kaizen and its unique selling value to anybody is that none of those issues apply at all. Now, it's not because um, lending has no risk. It is because the underlying product makes it extraordinarily safe for lenders. So what makes this unique? The loan is very, very different in Kaizen. The life insurance product is the sole and only security for the loan. Your risk at the end of the day is the payments you have made thus far to the plan. And I'll go into those payments in a second. In other words, the bank, if something goes wrong for whatever reason, the lenders that we have cannot come after you for anything other than the money that's been put into the plan already. They cannot come after you for any other thing. As a consequence, you have no outside liability at all. Because it's safe to the lenders, there is no loan underwriting done on you, so no financial background checks, credit checks, etc., no interest payments or personal guarantees. So if you think about the things you don't like about loans, for the most part, they're completely eliminated in the Kaizen plan. And if you can start to get loans on that basis, they start to become very attractive. How do we make this loan secure for the lenders? So in Kaizen, we start off with picking the worst in economic conditions we can find. We take interest rates up to 18%. We, 
we look at great depressions, we look at these extreme economic events, things that would decimate most other plans. And the reason for that is the thinking behind Kaizen was to make it a safety net for us personally. And the design that anybody gets is exactly the same designs myself, my partners, my children, my wife has. So they are designed to be extremely robust. So the current interest rate environment, for example, totally irrelevant to the design. Now, what we can illustrate is one thing because of the regulatory environment, but from a plan perspective, it's designed to withstand those kind of conditions. I mean, not, it's not even scratching the paintwork. The same as if we enter a Great Depression period. You know, I worry about the, the future world that my children will live in. Um, what happens if there's another Great Depression? So we designed it to withstand those kinds of environments. Now, no stress test is perfect, but I would argue that we've taken this to a point where the probability of it breaking is so low. And the banks agree with us, otherwise they would underwrite you for the loan. So, okay, that's great. What does it give me? I mean, because at the end of the day, I'm trying to improve my outcome. So the first thing is you get a life insurance policy. Now, life insurance may or may not be important to you, but I'll just point out that about 20% of the population die pre-retirement. So when you think you're in your golden years, everything's great. If you suddenly passed away or your spouse suddenly passed away, what would be the impact on your family? And everybody relates to that, but it's pretty low down the financial priority list. And so by the time you get that low, you just run out of money, right? You're doing everything else before that. But with that life insurance protection comes things, things called living benefits. And living benefits is just a fancy way of, well, not a fancy way. It's a way of triggering access to the death benefit while you're still alive. If you have a chronic illness, for example, or a terminal illness where your health plan won't pay for an experimental treatment that might save you. Those sorts of things. And bearing in mind that up to 70% of the population will have some sort of chronic illness before they die, those are useful. So I got some protections for things happening to me uh, and protects my family. But the main thing that about 90% plus of people purchasing Kaizen is for that extra cash growth or the potential for extra cash growth in the accumulation value of the life insurance policy. And that can be used for lots of things one of which is to supplement your retirement uh, earnings through the use of policy loans. And because it's life insurance, I get some other advantages, one of which is providing I follow the rules and Kaizen does, I can have tremendous tax advantages. Now, I mentioned in the case of us, when you start to make what the government determines is good, good money, they start to tax you accordingly. And so we were paying these rather high tax bills every year. But do I want my retirement subject to that? It does perplex me that so many defer taxes when statistically speaking, we're in a low tax environment now and statistically speaking, we're gonna be in a higher tax environment later. So why would I wanna defer the tax? I'll pay it now and then I don't wanna pay tax again. And you can do that by, as I mentioned, accessing the cash value through the use of policy lines. So as long as you keep the policy in place, which we do a lot of things in the designs to ensure, that's a very taxed advantage situation, particularly if you're worried about taxes going up. So what you get right away is the protections and what you then get the opportunity for is particularly if you leave the plan in place for uh, an extended period of time, you get the access to all this supplemental uh, cash. So how do we do that? We take the money you're willing to save, you make five payments. You can make more if you wish, but five payments is the minimum and you're done. The bank will match based on that funding ratio determined by stress testing for the first five years. If you stop at the end of the five years, the bank will then fund all the premium through to year 10. Now what we're doing here is we're funding the policy to the maximum we're allowed to by law. So there's a ton of surplus money in there. Costs after the 10 year funding period become de minimis. When I did the maths on mine, the average cost of life expectancy was below 50 basis points. So they can become very, very efficient if you fund them correctly. In the 15th year, the surplus cash value will be used to repay the lender and you keep the return on your money and the incremental return on the bank's money. So does this all sound good or does it actually work? Here's my policy that I did 10 years ago. The average return on that policy has been about 7.5%. You can see that not every year has it got that. Some years have been good, some years have been bad, but on average it's been 7.5%. And my cost of capital over that time period has been three and change. Now, over the 15-year period, all the statistics says 
um, I will average about 225 basis points or 2.25% on the bank's money. So I get the return on mine and that incremental return on the bank's money, which is about expected to be just over 2%. If you give it time, the probability of achieving that is extremely high. Now, we get some questions. And the first question is, this sounds too good to be true. Now, it's not really, uh, we're not really changing any rules, bending any rules or anything like that. What I would say for the vast majority of people is not that it's too good to be true, that it's unfamiliar. So let me just summarize why we believe it's not too good to be true. First, life insurance tax properties are well known and established. The key thing to understand that most people don't is the cash value is principally protected at all times. And so from a bank's point of view, they treat the cash value of a life insurance policy as cash. Now, banks, generally speaking, have no trouble lending against cash. And if you understand that, you'll understand why banks are comfortable. We're doing something the wealthy have done since 1960s. We're just de-risking it. They're prepared to take more risk than I was prepared to take in the plan uh, for myself. And so we're just de-risking it so the bank does not need any recourse back to you. Then we get another one, which is my advisor's never heard of this now, or the advisor who has never heard of it but won't admit to it, right? Um, I mentioned at the beginning this is a highly specialist area. So unless your advisor is trained on the financing of life insurance, it is highly unlikely they can give you good guidance. It's just not their specialty. It's nothing about that advisor. It's just it's a very specialist area. So we would strongly encourage you to talk to an advisor who is trained on this particular concept. Another question we get is what happens if the markets don't perform or if interest rates go up, all those sorts of things. So let's start with the markets. In the Great Depression test, we run that as a 15-year test. And your plans, if it was exactly the same as the Great Depression, will be fine. You won't get as much money, but it will be fine, and you will benefit from the plan. And if you think about a 15-year period of just market turbulence as bad as the Great Depression, what else would look good? We mentioned in the stress testing for interest rates, we, took, we, we looked for the worst period of interest rate um, change we could find, and that was 1980s. So we take it up to 18.3% interest rates. So again, if you think of mortgages or other leveraged investments, very few are stressed to that level. So the point here is the plan is designed to be extraordinarily robust when compared to your alternatives that you could choose. So what are those risks? Uh, there's clearly going to be risk in any plan uh, that's involving financing. Um, so we mentioned policy performance, Great Depression. We've mentioned interest rates, the 1980s. Uh, one of the biggest risks we find in this plan is clients not completing their funding pattern. So the key takeaways, it is highly unlikely you'll get to your goals unless you're able to bring this extra capital in play or unless you're able to save 50% of what you make. And that's a daunting task for most of us. In, in, in our case, we did this plan, as I said, to be a safety net. So we're focusing on bringing more capital. Everybody else we talk about on, when they're talking about Kaizen is talking about how to use your money you can save, not about how to bring more. We're trying to dramatically reduce the risk profile of the leverage that's being used, and that affects the design that we use that is designed to be extraordinarily conservative. And it's designed to be a safety net for you and your loved ones. It is not designed to be a get-rich-quick plan. So I'm just going to spend a few seconds just talking about ILIA. ILIA stands for Interactive Learning and Information Assistance, and it's designed to be an educational program. You will have been given a link, as I mentioned at the beginning, to go to this program if you were invited to this webinar by an advisor. With that, I'll open the webinar up to any questions that may come. Thank you for giving me your time. The first question is, in the current market of rising interest rates, how does that affect Kaizen in the short and long term? Sure. And that's a common question. So whoever asked it, thank you for asking it. So the first thing is to understand, think of interest rates as kind of like a, a leading indicator of where the, the caps of the IUL product, or the cap is the ability of the product to capture the upside of the market index. 
So what happens, think of the, I guess, what the, the analogy I'd like to use is imagine a big super tanker and a little tugboat. The tugboat changes directions, that's your interest rates. So interest rates go up. The policy will start to, in a more lag fashion, perform. So as a general rule, you would much prefer to have a higher interest rate because the higher rates go, the higher the cap of the life insurance product we're using goes. It's just lag. It's lag by about two years. And we built that into the design. So the question really comes down to, okay, well, that's great, but in the meantime, my loan cost has gone up. So what we did in the stress test of the 80s is we said, let's just pretend that interest rates, if, you, if you're a student of interest rates or, or student of interest rate history, 1980s didn't happen overnight. It gradually went up through the 10-year period through the 70s up hitting its peak in 1981. But what we do in the stress test is we say, look, we're hovering as we started Kaizen in a low interest rate environment, we had a low rate. We then pretend it goes to 16, then 18% overnight. Now that is pretty draconian, uh, certainly a lot worse than the situation we're in today. And we built enough buffering to allow the product to catch up and actually benefit. So your rough rule of thumb is for every 1% increase in interest rates, when the product catches up, you're gonna get about a 2% or more increase in your cap. Now, it's not as simple as that, that's a simplification. But you would way prefer to have a Kaizen plan in a higher interest rate environment than you would in a lower interest rate environment. And that sounds kind of counterintuitive because everybody focuses on the loan. But the moment you understand that the life insurance product, as all fixed life insurance products, universal life, whole life, and so on, much prefer a higher interest rate environment and perform much better, not just in terms of the caps, but also the way cash value grows relative to costs. So probably a more complex question than you, or response than you wanted, but when we designed the plan, it would have been beyond naive to assume interest rates were gonna stay low forever. And these are long-term plans. They were designed to be long-term plans. Uh, life insurance is a, a good long-term uh, cash grower, but not a short-term life insurance, is just not a good asset for short-term uh, cash growth. So when you're thinking about it from our perspective, would you have ever designed a plan where you hope interest rates don't go up over a 15-year period or some economic stress doesn't occur over a 15-year period? You know it's going to happen. It's just which of the stress events is it going to be? So if that's true and if you then want a safety net, the whole point is you build resilience in it to withstand those storms so that it can ride the storm out and come out of the other side. Next question. All right, thank you, Dane. Um, I'm gonna answer one really quickly for everybody because I'm getting a lot of this question. This webinar is recorded and will be emailed to everyone who registered, as well as you're welcome to talk to your agent about getting a link. And to the agents on the call, the link will be available in my ILIA. Next question for you, Dane. What are the minimum contributions to get involved with Kaizen and also the maximum? Right. So the maximum is the easiest one, first of all, because this is, at the end of the day, a life insurance contract, and you have to qualify for the life insurance. So what happens then is, let's go kind of reverse engineer it. If you have a certain amount of life insurance that you qualify for, and we've had people doing you know, 40, 50 million dollar policies on this thing, but they, they do it for different reasons. They do it for just as a cheaper way of getting life insurance. We then go reverse engineer. What's the maximum amount of cash we can put into this thing? And what is the correct funding ratio that you have to put in versus the bank to ensure it passes those stress tests that we've outlined? That's the largest. The smallest one is dictated by a series of, of constraints. This is a program design to be what the industry would call more, more highly compensated people. So it's not, it's not a retirement plan, it's a supplement plan, um, a way of creating the opportunity for supplemental income and having those life insurance protections, right? So uh, we have some minimum constraints. So the general rule of thumb uh, to take away, it's a little bit of a, of a sloped answer, but uh, 21,350 a year uh, is the minimum that you would put into a plan like this. As it starts to go below that, 
the policy would be so small as to provide a very incremental return. Now, there are a couple of exceptions on, on, on what I've just said, but that's the general rule I've got. All right, Dane, next one for you. Um, there's a lot of questions revolving around age and timing this in their lifespan. When's a good time and what are the age restrictions and requirements inside Kaizen? Sure. So let's deal with the restrictions first. Um, the youngest age, these have to be adults. So the youngest we can do in Kaizen is 18. Um, the oldest is from the analysis that we've done would be 65. Now, why 65? Um, when we look at leverage, we would say, why would a person, a logical person, take on leverage and the risk associated with that, albeit the risk within Kaizen, unless there's a compelling economic reason to do so? So at 65, we, dis we determined that we didn't feel the risk reward was advantageous enough to warrant it. The sweet spot, however, you then say, okay, why would a 65-year-old 60, be looking at this? Well, most of the people between 60 and 65 are not doing Kaizen as a supplement uh, income plan. They're using it as a, a more cost-effective way of buying life insurance they need, and also as a backup plan. So if you say, take that 15-year window I mentioned, well, at 65, you're going to be 80, right? But one of the concerns a lot of people in that age range have is, what if I outlive my retirement? And so they use it uh, for those two purposes as a way of buying life insurance and a way of having a stop gap, uh, a pool of cash uh, in the form of cash value that I can access if I start to run out of retirement income. Now, where's the sweet spot? The sweet spot is really uh, for those people who are in the age range of 35 to 55. So that's, if you look at the typical or well, the average, if there is such a thing, a Kaizen client, they're 46 years old and they're earning over $200,000 of income a year. Over All right, I got a hard one for you, Danny. Ready? Okay, this is going to be me. What happens if the bank fails? Yeah, um, so a good question, actually. So the first thing, if you ever want to see a grown man cry, uh, let's go back to the early years of NIW when uh, we were doing some of these other finance cases. Uh, one of the banks we were working with, we had this killer deal. It was going to make the company really big deal. The, the bank pulled out at the last minute. So one of the things we pursued as a company ever since then is multiple banking sources. Uh, we don't like to be concentrated on one kind of bank, any one bank, or even banking sector. So we're trying to diversify the banking up now. The question is, how likely is that? Well, you know, banks have gone out of business, right? Or they've changed their policy. So one of the things that happened at the beginning of this year, we used the purchasing power of Kaizen to leverage advantage. And we moved, uh, I think it was 600 lives in the first two weeks or three weeks of the, of the year from bank A to bank B. So uh, we have the facilities to do that and we have the contingencies to do that. But now let's, let's kind of look at the bigger question, which is, um, why would banks pull out? So one of the great advantages and one of the reasons we use life insurance is because banks treat the cash value inside life insurance as cash. There are very, very few asset classes out there where they treat it simply as cash. And we know that because they give the same credit terms as cash. You know, if you go with a property, they might give you 75 cents on the dollar. If they go with bonds, they might give you 80 cents on the dollar. Or stock portfolios, they might give you 50 cents on the dollar. Cash value life insurance, they're giving you 100 cents on the dollar. So you know they're treating it that way. But what happens if all the banks in, in that we could possibly access just can't play or don't want to play or for regulatory reasons can't play? What would happen is the banks, when the loan term matures, they would pull their money out. You're, the, we designed this policy so it always has more cash in the policy than the outstanding loan. So they take their money out. You would then have your policy and if the the collateral assignment on the policy would be lifted. You do whatever you want with the policy, um, and it's yours to, to look after. Now, some people have them in irrevocable trusts and some have them in living trusts, but it wouldn't in of itself collapse the policy. I think that's somewhat unlikely if you think about the underlying security of the loan note. Next question. Again, another one for you is, there's a lot of questions revolving around what happens after the 15th year 
and the build up to the 15th year. Could you better explain how the details of the policy work then? Yeah, that's actually a good question because it's one that's really, if you think about it, uh, more than just a Kaizen question. Um, because life insurance policies, even if you're not purchasing for the same reason that most people purchase Kaizen are for life, at least they should be. I mean, they don't quite, they quite often get left and lapsed, but the purpose of it is, so where's the, where's the servicing support and guidance for that? Uh, after all, if, if you have a policy that's 40 years, the person who sold it to you might be dead or retired, right? So what's going to look after you? So one of the things, we've actually asked that question a lot, and this is a particularly important question because my children are in it. So, you know, I might be dead by the time they look at this stuff. So one of the things we, we built into ILIA is what we call the servicing module. And the servicing module is doing something that the industry overall has been very poor at. So with the carrier partners that we've been working with, we're integrating the ILIA platform directly into their Enforce illustration systems and their Enforce support systems. So we can get the data and that's occurring over time. Some carriers are ready for that. Some carriers don't have the infrastructure for that, but we're integrating with them. So as we get closer and closer to blow and exit, we, we NIW have a monitoring team that's watching these policies every single year. You get an annual report every single year. But as we get closer to loan exit, what we're looking for is, is this the right time to do loan exit? Do we have enough resilience left in the policy or redundancy left in the policy to see it's comfortably through age 120, all those good questions. And so we will then work with the trustee to actually execute the loan exit. You'll get notifications of that. You know it's coming. But the servicing module, you'll have all that information uh, and that module is about to go live within the next month, I'm told by the, by the team. So first of all, you've got this module, right? So that's the 24 seven access point so that you can actually see what's happening to your policy at any time. Now let's go post loan exit. So the question then is, can I access this to be able to see that? It, this is assuming, of course, the agent, your advisor, is no longer available to guide them. I mean, they're the ones selling this and they should be, they have the relationship. But ongoing, if they've passed away, retired or whatever, uh, clients will be offered the opportunity to access that servicing portal thereafter to do a whole bunch of things, you know, claim requests, um, making sure we keep track of where your address is so somebody can actually contact you if something happens. Uh, how much money I should take out, why and when, based on actual performance as opposed to illustrated performance. All these things are built into the servicing platform so that you're not reliant on me or your agent or anybody else to provide long term, or, or for that matter, even the life insurance company to provide the long term access and more, perhaps more important guidance on what you can do with your policy post loan exit. Back to you, Sina. Thank you, Dane. There's a lot of questions revolving around younger generations gifting Kaizen or possibly getting Kaizen for my kids. What are some options in Kaizen in that regard? Sure, thank you. Um, so we have a variation of Kaizen that is being championed by one of my partners. Um, I say champion, she's the, she's the figurehead for it, um, called the Greatest Wealth Transfer. So let's look at the, the macro demographics of this country. 65 million people, the boomers, are retiring over the next 10, 15 years. The largest wealth transfer in history is occurring. And I think I saw a statistic, something like 70% of all the disposable income is being transferred over the next 10 years. We have this kind of uh, humorous video about it. So if you think about your children, and I think about my children a lot with this context, uh, I know with at least one of my children, if I gave um, them a lot of cash right now, they'd be very successful in blowing it. Um, so what can we do within the context of Kaizen? If you've got to the stage where your um, retirement and your quality of life is, is protected and you're good with that, most parents then shift to how do I transfer wealth to my children? So you can use your gifting allowances and or um, money that you've transferred, you, you can transfer over to them. You can use uh, 
there's, there's multiple sources of cash. So for example, let's imagine you had an annuity you don't need anymore. You could take the 10% uh, withdrawals out of it to fund and use to give to the client, to your children, sorry. However, a couple of caveats. Um, your children must be adults. We cannot do this for um, uh, infants. They have to be adults. They have to be able to sign as an adult on the trusts. Uh, but there is a variation of the theme called the greatest wealth transfer. I strongly, uh, for those clients who've been introduced by uh, an advisor to this, this webinar, uh, have a conversation with them. They can download uh, all the information on the greatest wealth transfer. It's a super cool technique. I'm actually using it for my children. So once we got to the stage um, where we were comfortable for our, our, our retirement and our golden years, my, my and my wife's uh, mindset completely shifted to how do we protect the children? Um, and so if you do the maths on it, when you get a 30 year old or you know, my, my children's 30, uh, 27, 25, when you do that 21, 350, holy cow, does it provide an incredible protection, not just for their future retirement uh, you know, supplements, but even things like, you know, when they have their children in 18, 20 years time to, or to fund them through college uh, or to fund the first house, or things that just you you know you can't access a lot of cash but you can access when i say a lot of cash in retirement plans and things like that they're tied up this after the bank's loan is uh, it's repaid it's a policy you can control it it's in a most of these are in living trust so you have full control you want to take policy loans out to pay for things that you need in life that's what it's there for and so what a great way of taking some money that you're willing to give amplifying it enhancing it through that leverage and providing a kind of opportunity for that future next 50, 60 years of your children to help protect them. I mean, I think it's phenomenal, but it's called the greatest wealth transfer. Mike, you see now. All right, here's an interesting one for you. What happens at year 15 if there's not enough cash value in the account to repay the loan? Does the interest on the loan continue to occur? Uh, sorry accrue until the point it can be repaid yeah so there's a variety of reasons why we notionally pick the 15th year um, so the the quick question is we delay loan exit until such time as there is but let me tell you why the 15th year not the fifth not the 10th not the 20th so if you look at a life insurance contract they're quite expensive in the first 10 years. I mentioned earlier, they're not the best short-term way of building up cash. They're just not designed that way. They become super efficient after that. So one is the cost drain. Um, I mentioned in my policy, the average cost of life expectancy is below 50 basis points, but you need time to get to that point. Anybody who's selling a life insurance policy that somebody going to need the cash out of in five years, that's just a, not a good fit square peg round hole. The next thing is predictability. You know, one of the things we want to make sure is that we do a lot of webinars and training webinars to agents where we talk about risk premium. Now the Index Universal Life, which is the life insurance product we're using for this particular technique, in some years it gets zeros, in some years it gets um, good returns. But if you look at risk premiums in, in the economy generally, they're extremely consistent over periods of time. So we use that 15 years so that we feel we have a very high confidence interval of not just being able to repay the loan. That is kind of easy because if you think about it, we're only 75% um, funding the premium rest is coming from you. So the probability of that is extraordinarily low. Um, what we're really trying to do this for is not to pay back the bank, but to actually generate a return. And so that 15 year has a very, very high probability of achieving the two to two and a half percent spread that we're targeting for this plan. Now, so what does that mean? Two and two and a half percent spread is on the bank money. But don't forget the bank's got three times more money in it than you've got in. So that, that's where you get that dramatic lift in potential income. So the 15th year we pick for that, we pick for the cost reasons. So it's both predictable, the costs are very low. Um, and then finally, we want to make sure we have enough surplus in that policy to make sure it's, it's, it's very comfortable live going out to age 120. So there's a whole variety of reasons that make that probability extraordinarily low. But ultimately, if it did happen for something worse than the Great Depression happened or something worse than the 1980s interest rate happened, 
Whatever that might be, we can always delay it until we can do that. Okay, back to you, Sina. All right, Dan, we got time for one more. It's a fairly long one, but um, this is a pretty consistent question from our viewers. Essentially, how early can you start to take tax-free distributions? Would it be possible to take them at age 45 if I'm starting in, say, my mid-20s? And how difficult is it to actually take out those distributions? Sure. So uh, I mentioned that, okay, so let's do a couple of things. First of all, you can pay off the loan at any time. You make a request, right? We're just suggesting from an optimal result perspective, you should wait 15 years. If, if Kaizen's being positioned to you as something that you should be able to get your money out in two years, that's just a, not the right position of the product. As I mentioned, life insurance, forget Kaizen, life insurance as an asset class is not a short-term uh, play. It's just not the way they're designed. But after the 15th year, once the bank has been repaid, that um, this is not a retirement plan where you have all sorts of constraints. Uh, it's not like a, an ERISA plan or anything like that where you get penalties. It is a life insurance contract. So providing that you don't over borrow from the policy, after the 15th year, you can borrow from the policy year 16 if that's what's appropriate. So some of the uh, employees here who have bought a plan on themselves, they plan to, at the end of the 15th year, I think it was year 16 or 17, they plan to pull some money out to pay for their kids through college. Once the kids are through college, they'll stop taking money out, they'll let it grow again, and then at 65, they'll take, they'll take money out uh, to supplement their retirement. So people overcomplicate this. It's a life insurance contract, now, once the bank is uh, uh, paid off, it is yours and yours to take out uh, money or leave. <coughs> You're not required to take money out, you just don't need it. Excuse me. <coughs> but the only caveat is this. You don't want to take out too much money because you want to make sure there's enough left over. There's something called an overloan protection rider on the product, but that doesn't kick in until 65. And the servicing module that I mentioned will give you some guidance on making sure you don't take out, take out too much, um, or you know, it'll give you some guidance on how much you should take out. But you have a lot of flexibility here. So did I use my time up, Sina? Yes, sir, you are out of time if you wanna just finish with some closing thoughts. Sure, so a couple of things. This is, um, we're doing this as an educational piece. You know, there's a lot of people who just want to hear information on Kaizen. We'll do more of these about once a month, covering different variations. We'll do one on the greatest wealth transfer because there's a lot of interest in that. Um, we'll do some about more of the underlying economics of the plan and, and some of the, the, the thinking behind it, providing we get that through compliance. So what I would say is um, if this is of interest and you want to hear more about it, please let us know. The other thing is, if we didn't answer your question directly, um, we will, please just type them into the chat and we will individually respond. And if you uh, have questions, please follow up with the advisor that uh, directed you to this webinar. Uh, communications is good, and we are more than happy to provide this kind of material to help you decide whether the plan is suitable for you. You know, we're not trying to say Kaizen's for everybody. We're trying to say it's a useful tool and a useful tool that brings more capital to the table in ways that others, other asset classes simply can't without taking on more leverage risk. So thank you so much for giving us your time this evening. Let us know how you feel about this particular uh, webinar and we look forward to ongoing communication. So have a brilliant evening.